what people are going to see is, is a lot of money is going to be made and a lot of money is going to be lost. And a lot of communities that look like communities today will no longer survive in a year because they're not based on certain values that are bigger than money, right? They're based on how quickly can I flip this to make money? And when most brands enter into the space, the problem is, is that the people that are attracted to the launch tend to be greed-based individuals. They're fudders, they're people who want uh, utility immediately for value to be enhanced to sell. And the challenge and the opportunity for many communities, and there's a lot of communities out there that I think do this really well, right? And the Cool Cats are one, right? That actually inspired me. The Robotos, Dead Fellows are one. I mean, there's tons. There's there's not one or two, there's tons in this space are ones that stand for bigger things. What's happening, gentlemen? How are we feeling? Feeling great. How about yourselves? I cannot, com cannot complain, cannot complain. We got a very, very special guest lined up for today. Who we got, Matt? We have Keith Grossman, the president of Time Magazine. Um, he's a media executive with a long track record of reviving and modernizing digital media brands. He's had leadership roles at Bloomberg and Wired, and he's responsible for leading the century, nearly a century old brand, Time, into Web3 over the past year. Um, and you know, after experimenting with tokenizing past covers, uh, collaborating on a cover with Beeple, and partnering with the Cool Cats community, he launched Time Pieces, uh, which is Time's Web3 community initiative. Uh, and featuring collaborations with leading NFT artists, as well as artists who had previously contributed to Time, uh, the Genesis Drop and Slices of Time Drop have done a total of more than 10,300 ETH in total sales volume. So that's more than $35 million. Um, so he's really at the forefront of, of thinking about how this technology can impact the media space. What stood out to you guys? I think more importantly for me, it's like his ability to take legacy brands and actually push them into the future. Like Time Magazine is an institution that's been around for centuries, right? Like we, all of our generations have grown up with the Time cover. We know what Time Magazine is and the importance of it. And just like the, his ability to move into the Web3 so swiftly and speedily with actual tangible results with a legacy brand, that's what really stood out for me. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, spot on. I think anybody that's currently working within a, a larger organization, even a smaller organization, like you're never too old to to be able to kind of evolve into this space and unleash a lot of the meaningful utility and potential that this technology has. I think a lot of it takes experimentation. It, it takes going down the rabbit hole yourself and understanding what actually can happen. And I think Keith is a, is a great example of that. Before we do jump into this episode, do want to encourage you, if you haven't already, check us out on YouTube. We roll out a series of different guides, whether it's debunking what exactly is an NFT, what is Web3, or even showcasing some of the creative journeys behind some of your favorite artists. You can go check us out at youtube.com slash NFT now. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, you know what to do. But without any further ado, let's jump into this week's episode, Keith Grossman. Keith, what's happening, man? How are you doing today? How are you, Sam? It's good to see you all. We're excited to have you on, man. I'd love to just kind of go back to the earliest stages of your journey. Obviously, you're uh, super deep down the rabbit hole now, but what kind of uh, initially sent you, uh, made you want to learn more about NFTs? Uh, well, I mean, look at my background. Um, I, you know, I started at Wired. My career was Wired and Ars Technica, right? And uh, then I went to Bloomberg and I've collected art. And so when you put sort of the combination of me being a dorky Jewish guy who loves tech, loves art, loves business, loves crypto, I mean, the space is, is sort of beautiful for me, right? And uh, I honestly, I mean, I've been in crypto since I think about 2014 when Wired wrote the article on mining Bitcoin. And I, I had written the check and approved the expenses with my partner, actually, Maya Drazen, who's at time uh, for the computer that the editors used to mine the Bitcoin. And I've been in Bitcoin and crypto quite on and off since then. Um, but it wasn't until the Nyan Cat um, uh, sale took place in February of 20, what was it, 2021, right? That uh, it dawned on me, wow, we could do this. 
Like this is really, it makes total sense. And so um, I never thought that I was going to be able to marry my personal passion for the space to my professional responsibilities. But um, I think that 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 one moment, the Nyan Cat sale, right? And I said this the other day in a Twitter spaces, just really opened up my eyes to the fact that something is changing, you know, um, that online renters are becoming online owners, that uh, people's digital identities are just as valuable as their physical identities, that the privacy of the individual is a really important sort of issue that, um, that online ownership solves a lot of current problems with, and that, you know, any industry that requires transparency or lacks transparency will be tremendously disrupted by the transparency that a token in a blockchain will be able to offer. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Um, look, Keith, you know, like I, given my background in, in legacy media, you know, billboard and spin, I know how difficult it can be within some of those organizations, large bureaucratic organizations that have existed for quite some time um, to lead these sort of change movements, uh, like the one that you've led at time. What has it been like, you know, sort of sort of bringing time into Web3 and NFTs? So, I, look, if you've ever read the book, Who Moved My Cheese, right? Like, oh, I love the, that book, man. Right? Like, uh, no, no, I, I have it. The premise is amazing, right? There's three mice. They wake up every day. The cheese is right there. One day they wake up and the cheese is gone. First mouse goes, I'm going to find the cheese, puts on his running shoes, goes, runs, finds the cheese. The second two mice, one says, I'm going to wait. The cheese will come back tomorrow. The third says, I'm going to wait. The cheese will come back tomorrow. Two weeks go by. The second mouse goes, cheese is still not returned. You know, let me uh, go put on my running shoes and, uh, and go find it. And, uh, and then the third mouse, you know, never does it. You know what happens to the third mouse, Matt? What happens? He dies, right? Because he doesn't evolve. And, you know, like with any organizational change, you know, there's going to be people in the beginning that are really excited. And then there's going to be people, in, you know, that want to wait and see some success. And then there's going to be people who are just not going to be into it. And that's fine. You know, all three are totally fine, in my opinion. And I've seen that, whether we were evolving Wired or Ars Technica or Bloomberg Media um, and now Time. And, you know, when I first entered into the Web3 space, there was only two or three people, our chief legal officer, right? Our head of creative, D.W. Pine, um, Maya Drazen, Bharat Krish, who really jumped in, and Lane Little, who really jumped in and said, I believe in what you're doing. Like, this is, I see this. Um, everyone else sort of took like, a, this is interesting, let me wait and see, and that's fine. And the first drop really caught everyone off guard. You know, it was three covers. We did it about a year ago today. Um, uh, it was, is God dead, is truth dead, and is fiat dead? And nobody expected those three covers to generate about $440,000 in sales on day one. And then from there, you know, we knew that there were certain things we wanted to evolve into, you know, accepting uh, cryptocurrencies for digital subscriptions at time. And think about why we would do that as a legacy brand, right? As a legacy media brand, you really have just three options for capturing revenue, cash, credit, or check. And a lot of people actually pay in checks still, right? So if your funnel is only, you know, four inches wide, why not accept 32 different cryptocurrencies, right? We settle them in Bitcoin, but like, why not accept them for digital subscriptions? And so we launched time.com slash hodl, and you could spend any one of 32 cryptocurrencies for um, uh, access to time.com. It's actually 33 now, because on Sunday I announced that we were gonna accept ApeCoin, and by Tuesday, we actually implemented it. So, and people have bought, digital subscriptions using ApeCoin since the implementation, which is amazing. Um, and then the final one was, and I couldn't figure it out at first. And this is where I actually think that, you know, brands like yours, people like the three of you who've been unbelievably helpful to me, um, people like Jay and Silva, Thank You X, you know, Farouk, um, 
uh, infinite individuals across spaces and and clubhouse even when when that was when everyone was there in the day. Um, you know, I knew that there would be a point that you could take the token and the blockchain and change the relationship with the consumer. I just didn't know what it was. It took me seven months to figure it out and listen to everyone. And then when when it snapped and it hit me, I was like, it has to be called time pieces. Like for some reason, I just really liked that. And, and that was it. And then from there, you know, we, we just sort of pushed it through. We really just forced it through. And, and you know, uh, the team has been awesome. Uh, that's an incredible journey, especially for a legacy brand that's such as time that has been so culturally relevant for the la- over a century now, right? And so in terms of relevance and cultural adoption, we'd love to get your perspective for some of our audience or community members who don't know what timepieces are. Uh, would you be able to explain what what is and what are timepieces? Sure. So, you know, timepieces are NFTs that um, we use to build a much larger community against. But, you know, if you think about what the equation for success is in Web2, right? The equation for success, and, and credit actually to Farouk on this one, because he put this in a tweet in June of last year, July of last year, and it really stuck with me. The, the equation for success in Web2 is a brand finds a creator who attracts an audience. So picture this as time. Time finds a writer who attracts readers, right? The equation for Web3 is a community supports a creator, right? Uplifts a creator, believes in a creator. And the brand's job is to uplift the creator further. And by validating the creator to that community, the community then validates the brand, right? And that's really interesting when you think about it, because to the creator, it's very confusing. You're right in the middle of the equation. And to the brand, it's very confusing because you used to dictate how everything went. And now all of a sudden, you're sort of just the hero and the validator of the space. And you're the uplifter of the space. And you can act as a filter of the space. And, you know, for me, when I started to think about that, what that meant was instead of time finding a, re- a creator who then attracts an audience, it really was I had to pay attention to what's the type of community that I want the time brand to associate with or become. Um, what type of creators associate themselves with that community? Does the community believe in these creators and uplift the creators? And if they do, how can the time brand lift it up higher? And so think about this for a second. The time brand and time pieces, if you look at the NFTs, is never front and center. It literally is just a little logo in the corner. And outside of the name and that little logo in the corner, what time pieces as an NFT is, is really a piece of art. It's a beautiful piece of art. And it's done by an unbelievable creator. Now, um, we have in the timepiece family uh, today uh, 78 public timepiece artists. And we have about 90 or so uh, timepiece artists total because in our next sort of drop that we're going to be doing, which is with this sort of an artist in residence drop, we brought in a few new timepiece artists that we're really excited about. The thing that's fun or fascinating about the Web3 ecosystem is a few things. One is the difference between an audience and a community is huge. Very few people think about that right? An audience just cares about the moment, right? Um, The audience uh, will look at an article on time, read it, and may never come back, right? A community is there to build, to support, to uplift you, right? Like a community is there through up and down. And so any instance where you can build a community, it's far more valuable than building an audience, right? Even if it's a smaller community, than the audience because a community really cares about the brand's success. Now, what's really important for me when I started to think about this was if we were gonna build communities, we had to build a values-based community, right? And I think that this is the thing that confuses or scares most people in the NFT arena, which is what's the difference between a a values-based community and a greed-based community? 
right? And right now, what captures a lot of the headlines is greed-based communities, right? Or greed-based outcomes, um, which is short-term, huge financial gains, right? But that can't sustain itself over time. And the reality of this shift towards consumer ownership, to online, towards privacy in the consumer's hands, towards transparency is actually like a 20-year macro trend, right? But right now we're in a very small moment and what people are gonna see is, is a lot of money is gonna be made and a lot of money is gonna be lost. And a lot of communities that look like communities today will no longer survive in a year because they're not based on certain values that are bigger than money, right? They're based on how quickly can I flip this to make money? And when most brands enter into the space, the problem is, is that the people that are attracted to the launch tend to be greed-based individuals. They're fudders. They're people who want a uh, utility immediately for value to be enhanced to sell. And the challenge and the opportunity for many communities, and there's a lot of communities out there that I think do this really well, right? And the Cool Cats are one, right? That actually inspired me. The Robotos, Dead Fellows are one. I mean, there's tons. There's, there's not one or two. There's tons in this space are ones that stand for bigger things, right? And so like everyone in the timepiece community knows that our Discord channel, the conversations and the way in which we treat each other have to be inclusive. They have to be optimistic. They have to be uh, constructive, right? You could tell me that I'm wrong. Just give me a real reason for how I should evolve, right? Right, how our team should evolve. And they have to be give first. And those are the values that we're building timepieces around. And then if you own an asset within the timepieces community, you gain access to what I would say is the best of what the time brand has to offer, right? So we do programming specifically for holders within our Discord. Or if you hold the timepieces in your wallet, you can connect your wallet to time.com and it removes the paywall for frictionless access to the site. And so I think that when you look at what we're trying to build is we're trying to build our existing Web 2 business on one component over here. We're also building our Web 0 business, which is what we call print, but is still something that we value, right? Um, and we're building a Web 3 business that listens to and evolves with the sort of um, perspectives of the community. But then we're also building what we're calling a Web 2.5 business, which is how do we take the best of Web 3 and bring it into the Web 2 world? And how do we take the best of Web 2 and bring it into the Web 3 world? I think that's an incredibly important aspect of bridging those two worlds, right? And so in terms of like bringing this up, what was the conversation with Mark Benioff around this? I know he recently purchased and uh, purchased time outright and things of that capacity. And what, how does the vision that you have for time pieces and Mark's relationship have come together into backing this forward? Sure. So, I mean, Mark and Lynn purchased time uh, at this point, four years ago, right? And I joined Time almost three years ago, right? And I mean, if you look at my background, right? Like I'm not a, um, uh, uh, I'm not a good grow 5% person, if that makes sense, right? Uh, you know, and this is, I mean, this is just, just to sort of give perspective, like at Wired, in 2010, we were the first Condé Nast brand to fully digitize our brand and have, and exceed digital revenues versus print revenues. Nobody was doing that, right? We were, um, we launched the tablet edition in 2010 that Steve Jobs held up and we built with Adobe for their digital publishing suite, um, you know, that had the largest number of downloads. And Steve Jobs said, this is how a magazine should look on a device like this. Um, when we took over Ars Technica, we realized that the community's engagement was so strong that um, uh, that uh, we could create a predictive algorithm uh, that could tell if an article was going to go viral or not, right, uh, within an hour and a half. And uh, we turned it into what's called the Ars Accelerator. During that time, we won two Project Isaac Awards on uh, digital advertising inventions. At Bloomberg, I worked on 
bringing together all the different platforms into one Bloomberg Media, but then launching QuickTake, their social mobile digital video network. And so like, I don't take what I said in the beginning lightly. Like I'm just a dork that really just loves media and loves evolving it and building it. And uh, I love crypto and I love the space. And, you know, everyone has their best laid plans. Like I joke all the time, the great philosopher, Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth, right? Um, I had my plans for how we were going to evolve. It wasn't until I saw the Nyan Cat sale that I realized, wow, like we could do this. Now, the irony is, is it was Mark who sent me the Nyan Cat sale who said, did you see this? And Mark from the beginning was very supportive. Um, but as Mark saw that we could take this from one of one episodic sales, you know, of covers of time and turn it more into a community, the second he saw the launch of time pieces, I think it really changed everyone's perspective that this could be a real business, if that makes sense. And that this could really be a way in which the time brand can not just play catch up in web two, but leapfrog into web three. And, um, you know, I, I genuinely in my heart believe that this trend is very real and, you know, uh, there's something fun. And I have to assume the three of you have that same desire for that fun, right? Of every day building on that invisible bridge. And there's something kind of amazing about that. Um, but what I will say is, is a year ago, a year ago, last March, when I announced time was going to enter into the space, I got more text messages or emails from my friends within the media space or leaders within the media community asking if I was crazy or if I was on drugs or if something was wrong, um, uh, what was I doing? And in the past, you know, one month alone, I've presented Web3 to, you know, the World Economic Forum's Board of Governors for, you know, media and entertainment. I've presented the Web3 evolution at the Lake Nona Impact Forum. I've presented uh, the Web3 revolution to Bank of America's institutional traders and uh, clients. Um, I've had numerous conversations with Fortune 10 and 50 CMOs and CEOs. And I've had numerous conversations with many, many publishing brands around the idea of how do you use this to you know, evolve what a future subscription would look like within the you know, media ecosystem. Because you have to remember, if you look at Web2 today, you're dealing with an ecosystem that privacy is really, really becoming center. And with things like GDPR and CCPA and the disappearance of third-party cookies, a lot of publishing companies don't have enough first-party data to understand how to build and sustain their businesses. All of a sudden, when you have these NFTs into the market and the NFTs can act as a token that opens up a subscription, what you realize is, is everything you thought you needed to know about a consumer, that you were Matt Medved, that you lived in a certain place, that you this was your address, is irrelevant. I don't need to know that. But if you connect your digital wallet to our site, I can look at Google Analytics and see what you're reading. But at the same time, because the Ethereum blockchain is a public blockchain, a default public blockchain, I can understand what did you buy. And then contextually, that combination of what do you read and what do you own can give me a better predictor as to who you are as an individual. And what you technically become is a very good subscriber, a premium subscriber who owns an asset. The subscription itself becomes secondary instead of primary, but then from a understanding of who the consumer is, I can target you contextually far more accurately on the site from an advertising perspective. And finally, the reality of this space is not that people want to remain anonymous. It's just that if people want to give up their anonymity, there has to be a trade-off where you as the consumer are valued. And I think that that's a really good thought about this evolution, right? Because when you're an online renter, you're not valued as the consumer. When you're an online renter, uh, you sit on one of these platforms and you get 
all of the ability to project what you want your life to look like to people in return for your data, right? And they use your data against you however they want. In the Web3 evolution, uh, the responsibility of a brand to its community is, listen, stay anonymous as long as you want. But if you want something of real value, like you have to come out of your anonymity, you have to dox yourself. And like a great example I'll give is, is if you're a timepiece holder, if you owned the Genesis timepieces, we said we were holding a contest where we would give five invites to the time person of the year when Elon Musk was named person of the year, right? Thousands of people in the community entered in, right? Thousands for five spots and you had to dox yourself and you had to take a PCR test, okay? So it's like dox yourself and shove something up your nose. Think about that, right? And people still did it, not because they didn't want to be anonymous, but it was they saw the trade-off and the value. And I think that that's really key in terms of this, this evolution that's taking place is, you know, a lot of people like to say web one is a read-write web, a read-write web, and web two is a read-write social web, and a read and web three is a read-write social financial web. But really, web one is consumer privacy. Nobody owns anything. Web two, they, the platforms, own you. And in web three, you own you. And that's really key in this evolution. Yeah, no, I absolutely love that. And it's really exciting to see how you're leveraging kind of the, the time platform to really experiment and bring a lot of these different uh, iterations to market. I'm curious as we like continue to extrapolate a bit, like how do NFTs and how, how will NFTs and Web3 really disrupt the media space? Like I, I think right now we're at this interesting place where even just to engage with NFTs, there's still a lot of friction within the user experience, but over the course of the next one, two, three years, we're going to see this be a much more intuitive, streamlined experience. As the technology, as the user experience evolves, how do you think we'll see that disrupt media? Sure. So, I mean, right now we are at the earliest stages. I mean, uh, if you think about it in terms of like the digital evolution, we're in the, you know, John Knopf made a joke to me once where he said, you know, we're in the prodigy CompuServe era, right? Like we are 100% in that prodigy CompuServe era. Like another way of thinking about it is, is, this is the problem with the space right now is the technology is too prevalent, right? Um, the space will mature and evolve when the technology disappears and people focus on the experience, not the technology, right? It used to be that you would buy a computer and you would talk about things like the specs. You had a 386, a 486, a Pentium, right? Think about that. If you even remember those, right? You had a Pentium computer, 64 megabytes of RAM, 312 megabytes, 512 megabyte hard drive, right? Nobody talks about that anymore. Nobody cares. I don't have any clue what, what my you know, CPU is in my MacBook. I couldn't care less either, right? The day that that all changed was when Steve Jobs held up the, the, um, the iPod and he said, thousand songs in your pocket, right? And I think that what's going to happen with the NFTs is, is there's going to be a day where we don't talk about the word NFT. It just disappears. And you talk about everything that the NFT enables the consumer. Now, here's why we're a little far away from it today, but like it'll probably evolve very quickly over the next 18 months or so. Um, I remember the day that my mom, who is an 80 year old Jewish woman called me up and said, and since we're on a thing, she'll probably listen to this and yell at me. She, this is my impersonation of my mom. She goes, Keith, put me on the Twitter. And I'm like, first off, it's Twitter. It's Twitter, right? But <laughs> over the phone, over the phone, I could explain to her how to set up a Twitter account, right? And she was on within five minutes, right? That's how I knew Twitter had become mainstream. There is no scenario with the exception of Matt Medved's parents, because we've seen it on Twitter, right? There's no scenario outside of Matt Medved's family that my 80-year-old mom says the following, Keith, get me a Coinbase account and connect it to my bank account. Do me a favor, transfer the money from my bank account to the Coinbase and convert it to Ethereum. 
Oh yeah, do me a favor. Wait, wait, wait. I have to wait seven days? Okay, I'll wait seven days and I'll come back to you. First off, that's never happening. Okay, great. I waited the seven days. What do I do now? Oh, I have to get a MetaMask account? Awesome. What's that? Um, okay, I'll transfer to that. And I can just tell everyone my seed phrase, right? No, I can't tell anyone my seed phrase? Okay, now I can buy an NFT. Like, think about how much friction is in that process, right? Like, it is unbelievably challenging. And so when you think about that, and you think about the fact that every day that goes by, more and more people enter into the NFT space. Think about what will happen every single time one of those friction points disappears, right? Nobody should care about whether it's Ethereum or Solana or Bitcoin or cash, right? You should just be able to buy, right? Nobody should have to think about the wallets. Nobody should have to think about the seed phrases. Nobody should have to think about any of that stuff. If you like something, you should just be able to buy. Now, the beauty is, is, is where I think NFTs go ultimately is, and this is a huge sweeping prediction, but I think any industry that um, lacks transparency will be ultimately disrupted by what NFTs provide from a verifiability perspective. So, and when I say Web3, I really mean, I mean, uh, crypto, DeFi, NFTs, and the metaverse, right? So picture where the next few years can go. If you or anyone and every person who's listening to this podcast has definitely transferred money from MetaMask to MetaMask, right? So that's DeFi. How easy, Matt, how easy is it to send somebody you can send unbelievable amounts of, of money for what, a dollar fifty, right? Right. With no middleman, no paperwork, no nothing. The banks and the financial industry will go through the same type of evolution that that media and music went through. Right. And guess what? Media and music are still around, but they're evolved, right? Um, I think that any industry that requires verifiability, right? Or that lacks transparency will find transparency in it. So why is it surprising that art is all of a sudden, uh, you know, leading the way here? Because art's the least transparent <laughs> business on the planet until NFTs came around. But how amazing will it be when the medical industry, probably not on the Ethereum blockchain, but on something like Graph or Polkadot that is default private, you know, uh, can can enter in, right? Like, or how interesting will it be when the banking industry can adopt a chain like Algorand, right? Which is designed specifically for it, right? Um, I think all of these industries, you know, the auto industry and deeds, you know, the housing industry and and deeds, um, uh, anything anything that can be disrupted through through providing transparency and verifiability, I think will. Um, and by the way up to voting, hopefully one day, because I don't understand how you can have a global decentralized financial ecosystem and yet find that voting on a blockchain from your cell phone is not necessarily a good evolution and use of the technology, right? And so I think everything ultimately gets disrupted by what this technology has to offer, but it will happen on varying timeframes. Absolutely. And no, I think those are great points. Um, you know, one thing I'd love to chat about, too, is just like the future of tokenized content. You know, it's been really interesting to see how, um, you know, you started the evolution of your approach, how you started with those old Time magazine uh, covers that, that had that historical value. Then, then you minted a, a Time cover um, on Super Rare that was designed by Beeple. Um, it initially sold for around 320K and then resold for more than uh, 2 million. Uh, dollars and and then you you recently minted an entire virtual time magazine edition uh, that that featured Vitalik Buterin, uh, Ethereum's co-founder, on on the cover. Uh, so that progression is really interesting to see, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to what does that what does the future of tokenized content within the media context look like? So, I, I mean, it's so funny. Um, so one of the responsibilities I think that. I have in time being in this space is um, we have to 
really think about everything we do because um, we're putting our brand's trust sort of on certain areas. And, um, and, and we sometimes, I do think that, and I take this seriously, whether it's correct or incorrect, but I think that when we do certain things, we validate certain things on purpose, right? And that we act as a larger bridge to the general public. Um, Bharat Krish, our CTO, told me that 50% of timepiece holders, this is the first NFT they've ever owned. Um, I've asked him to give me that stat where it came from. He cannot seem to find it anywhere or he just ignores me, but I like that stat. And I do think it's very high, right? We spend a lot of time making sure that we're educating and onboarding people into the space. Um, Neil Strauss, uh, who's New York Times bestseller, uh, through Wit, published a book on, um, uh, on the blockchain. And I was so impressed with that. It was so interesting, right? It's very easy to focus on how do you, how do you create, um, how do you create value off of visual content, right? Uh, artists. I think we're beginning to see Matt, and I think that you know you've done a great job covering it, and I know it's a passion point for you, right? Like music and NFTs, and you know, and this I'll give you like a little bit of alpha, but like our next drop is with a major producer and musician right? And it's a music NFT, right? And like, we're just going to continue to evolve and test and play with different sort of ways in which these tokens and experiences for our community can, can interact. But I'm so excited about it, right? Because I have never done a music NFT before. And I'm just like learning so much as we do it. Um, ben Mesrick, who wrote Bringing Down the House, has done a lot of really interesting ways of bridging community and is physical books and NFT books. And I really respect him for that. And, you know, I looked at the technology with my team and we just thought, you know, and we knew that we had this Vitalik cover coming up and we just knew that like, wow, like we wanted to do this with, with Lit a while back on a different cover that we had and that cover didn't come through. And then Vitalik just seemed so exciting, right? Like it seemed like, wow, you have someone who is so respected within this space. And if you think about time, time is really about capturing living history within the red borders. Like we kind of rushed it and we said, you know what, we really, really, really want to make sure that this is the first issue that we bring out is on the blockchain. And, um, and you know, Lit helped us and that's why they're a great partner, Transient Labs and Ben Strauss, you know, um, helped sort of implement and build the tech behind it. And um, you know, for me, the thing that I think about quite a lot is we figured out how to monetize the, the visual and we figured out how to monetize audio, I think. We'll see. Um, uh, but like, how do you start to monetize the great written content, right? And um, I don't know if it's ever going to be able to be monetized if it's commoditized news, right? But if it's something of perspective that's evergreen, if it's something that emotionally has a connection to the individual, I think that that's where tokenizing the written word will really become valuable, right? Um, I don't think if I reported on here's times, you know, NFT on the day's breakdown, it means anything. That would go to zero in value every day, right? But I think that people will look back at that moment of the Vitalik issue and, you know, the one thing I know for sure about time covers is, is you can look at any of them over the past 99 years and you know exactly what was happening at that moment in time. And I think that that's really why people were, were, were really supportive of it. And um, I've been very, very surprised. Uh, nearly $800,000 in secondary sales since Wednesday um, with a, a, you know, a floor of around $1,000 for the issue. And this was a free airdrop, right? And so... You know, I look at those stats not because I care about floor prices, because I don't, right? I look at those stats because I'm looking at what's the consumer demand for something like this in the marketplace. And that's something that I'm learning right now. I don't know the answer to. If you have it, Matt, I, I want to know it. <laughs> uh, that's, that, that's a conversation for another day. But um, 
you brought on a, you brought on some very interesting concepts as like you know testing and iterating and you know experimenting across different mediums within the NFT uh, within the NFT space. How do you vet different NFT creators and projects both to work with professionally as timepieces and personally as a collector? Sure. So, you know, I spend a lot of time on Twitter spaces, as you all three of you know. And um, I actually like being in the audience um, more than I like being up on stage. Sometimes I like being up on stage when I, I like it when like I feel comfortable with the people and I know the people and I know the room. Um, but what I really look for when I'm in those rooms are, you know, people who are um, sharing the same values as time, right? Like the stuff that I had talked about, inclusive, optimistic, you know, constructive, uh, you know, they they give give first to a lot of people. I look at how those people uh, build their brand. What is their grit? right? Not everyone has to be over 25,000 followers. Like somebody made this comment that said, will you ever give a shot to artists who have under 25,000 followers? And we've given plenty of shots to, you know, infinite artists that have under 25,000 followers. And part of the way Time Pieces is set up is uh, we invite in a certain number of artists and every artist has an invitation to invite in an artist that they believe deserves a platform to grow. And we've never once rejected an invited artist never once okay that's how that's how important this artist curation is and, and that was influenced by the way by jn silva and, and thank you x by ryan um, who i thought did a remarkable job doing that and onboarding people into the ecosystem now um, i look for artists who have a diversity of of perspective right i look for artists that have communities surrounding them, right? I look at artists that I think align with our values. And I look at artists that like, that I actually think just like, just give a shit. Like if I could say that, right? Really just care, right? Um, and, you know, like take, take, you know, like a uh, rough draft, right? Take rough for a second, right? And like, here's an artist who for nine months, didn't sell a piece. Didn't sell a piece for nine months, showed up every day, built his brand, really cares, right? Gave back to the community, has a following. And then all of a sudden, you know, like one day, and I think I joke with John Knopf, like John sells his ape. John goes to bid on Ruff's piece. I loved Ruff's piece. So I was like, you know, F you, John, I'm going to outbid you on this just to mess around. And next thing you know, John owns a piece. I own a piece and people are jumping in and buying his pieces and he's happy. And, you know, he's been validated. I'm thrilled because I think he's an amazing artist. And, you know, he's somebody who's not yet a timepiece artist, but totally on my radar because I think, you know, he showed up every day. Right. And, you know, the people who are not, going to become timepiece artists are the people who just show up, you know, on one day and think that they're entitled to something of that nature, right? And like what I'm looking for is, is who does the community really care about? Not who do I care about, right? Who does the community care about? And then does that individual align with our values? And that's how, that's how we look at the artists. There's no application process. But I will say that like, as we start to build out timepieces with the investment that we got, and, and we're gonna really lean into this Web3 evolution, you know, the four areas that I'm really focused on in terms of operationalizing it are uh, the creator success, right? So the artists, you know, how do we make sure that, that we can open, you know, our brand to the maximum number of artists and help onboard people into the NFT ecosystem who might not be careful, who might not know it. The community and the collector success, right? So like the community is really important to us because it's the largest group of people who resonate with us from a values perspective, but they might not be collectors. But then the collectors are just as important to us. These are people who have purchased an asset of our brand, a piece of our brand, and they, they want to see the success of that over time. And 
uh, we genuinely believe that value will, will create value over time, right? Our values will create value over time. The third is CMO and brand success. So you're going to see us working with a lot of brands to onboard them into the space, right? Like we could do a lot that a lot of brands can't do. And we realize we're so far ahead of other brands that we want to make sure that we're helping them. And the fourth is, and we've also gotten really good at building the technology for minting and for, you know, uh, onboarding people in. So, you know, that's another weird, interesting area. And then the fourth is what I call blockchain to big screen, right? And this is when you see things like the Robotos and the deal that we did and, and you know, Smilesverse or Toy Boogers or, you know, the Littles. Like, how do we take what I think is some of the best creativity that I'm ever seeing in my life in Web3? Because there's nobody telling people not to create something. People are just creating and then communities are resonating around them. And how do we then use Time Studios, which is our larger long form division for television and film to, to help bring these communities to the big screen? And so that's where like my focus is over the next year. That's amazing. Super exciting. And I mean, I, I know you really did make a, a shift uh, as you kind of been the president of Time, but have been public about the fact that you're really shifting a lot of your focus to largely go all in with your time on, on Web3. I mean, um, what's, that evol what's that evolution been like? Uh, what, what kind of was the impetus? I mean, the impetus was two things. Um, and I think the three of you can relate to this. One is, actually is a few things. I don't want to say two. One is every day I wake up and I go to sleep and I just love this space, right? And I can look at the three of you and you're all smiling. Even you, Sam, are smiling. I can see you grinning there. Now you're really smiling. Matt smiling, Alejandro smiles first on this one. But like, boy, is it a really fun space, right? Because we're all in it together. Like we're all kind of building this together. We're learning from each other together. Um, two is the space, when you start to think about it, is really fascinatingly connected, right? Like, and so all of a sudden we can have these relationships that we've never been able to have before. And, you know, from just, let's say a collector perspective to get to know an artist wow, is that like not the best feeling on the planet, right? Like when you went and painted with Fiwo the other day, Matt, was that not just the coolest feeling on the planet? Like there was the no point. There was no point in like the 1800s that, you know, the head of a major media brand would just go and hang out with Van Gogh and paint, right? <laughs> like it just didn't happen, right? But like you have this moment where collectors and creators are connected in a way that like god that's so cool third i mean how fun is this like if you genuinely believe that we're in a 20-year cycle moving from online rentership to online ownership if you genuinely believe that you know these communities are a recalibration of of social circles moving away from demographics and geographics and moving towards psychographics if you genuinely believe that um, you know, consumers value their privacy, but will give up their privacy for value, right? Like, and if you genuinely believe that we're moving into a world where someone's digital identity is just as valuable as their physical identity, then how cool is this space? We are literally living through what will probably be the most powerful transformation that we'll ever see. And when I was at Wired, and I joined in 2020, in 20, in 2002, right out of college. Like I watched the digital revolution take place. Everyone come online from New York as an associate. And what did I get to do? I got to read about it. And then I come into this space and I meet people like you and I meet creators and I meet builders. And I start to see, wow, I can help shape and build what I think the internet of the future will be for my eight-year-old daughter, Ellie. And then I think about that and I'm like, I wanna make sure that I'm really involved in that and shaping it and forming a positive internet, a constructive internet, right? A, an inclusive internet. And so, 
I couldn't stop thinking about it every day. And then you apply the fact that if you like crypto, which I love, and you're an insomniac, which I am, and you're a workaholic, which I also am, it's like the best worst thing on the planet to get pulled into. And so I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And I couldn't let this opportunity pass me by because in my past, I looked at the evolution of web two. And I said to myself, wow, like I don't want to miss that. If I can actually take a real active role in web three, like I don't want to miss that. And, and I had a real long conversation internally. I said, I'll do everything I can to transfer responsibilities, but I really, really, really think that this is moving fast. It's moving very fast, right? I need, I think it needs extraordinary focus. I think it needs dedicated resources, but like, I think that we can leapfrog time into web three and really have great impact and really modernize the relationship that our consumer has with our brand. And that's, that's why I, I, I really wanted to make this, this shift. And um, I was very, very, very passionate about it. Well, that, that's absolutely fascinating. I think you've been doing a fantastic job in uplifting the community alongside your journey of trying to really implement this within time, man. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Grateful for all that you're doing and also grateful for you coming on today. No, well, thank you guys so much for having me and, and congratulations to the three of you. I mean, I think you and, and NFT now have just crushed it. I think that you have done an amazing job. I, I think the three of you are just incredible individuals, even when you won't smile, Sam. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and I just love watching your continued ascension. And so thank you so much for having me on today. Thank you, Keith. Is mutual. Appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. Man, Keith, super smart guy. Love how he's paving the way for such an incredible legacy organization into Web3. I think his, uh, his passion for the community, his desire to find and uplift emerging talent in the space, and even just the, his journey of education to not only educate people within his organization, but to go about building his own platform and educate people and, and showcasing how larger organizations and existing brands can thoughtfully engage in the space was, was really powerful. Well, so that's you, Alejandro. I think like the way he's thinking about uh, like just artist relations and taking on like really undiscovered artists and bringing them forward through Web3 is really, really something that stood out for me and uplifting others through the time um, program that he has, the in-house residency program that they have. And then the other thing that really stood out for me is like his ability to just uh, uh, accept payments from different crypto companies and then that, like uh, convert them into Bitcoin. And that, that was really forward thinking. And I think that's a small step that's going to have, you know, third, second and third order magnitude consequences that we may not be aware of it yet. And just his ability to think about multiple multiple dimensions of the same game, right? Like he's playing 4D chess while others are still trying to figure out their programmatic strategy. I feel that. I feel that. And one thing, like ha just having that finger on the pulse of the NFT space, like, you know, we've been in so many Twitter spaces with Keith, like he's really showed up, he shows up. And like, I, I think like uh, a lot of, you know, brands and organizations can take a, take a cue from him because like, he didn't just come in hot with timepieces out of nowhere. Like he's been in this, he's been, he was talking, he was engaging, he was, he was learning, he was, you know, being a part of the space um, for months before he ever announced timepieces. And yeah, I think that's really critical. Like he's he really built a like a level of like trust and credibility by by consciously engaging in a way that's 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 difficult for a media executive of, of his stature and, and and of his schedule, you know, uh, to, to do in a meaningful way. He really took the time to, to, to show up and, and be a part of these conversations and be a part of that community. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's been as successful as he had. Thousand percent. Well, uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everybody, for listening and tuning in. Really appreciate your support. If you haven't already, definitely be sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter at nftnow.com. Um, and we'll be back next week. Until then, we out.